I have a mixed emotions of uh, being an owner. Mm-hmm. You know, I I made a lot of money. <clears throat> I ended up running out of it in the biggest banking crisis that took me down and put me in a big position. I ended up writing it all off and letting people like Parrish make a lot of money off my deeds. That's the way the world goes. I've accepted my medicine. But I did have a, a dim view of chief executives in football. I felt that they, most of the time, got jobs in certain spaces because they because they were in some, somehow involved in the football world. I likened them to people that were actually weren't capable of running news agents. And I also felt that they were in a very difficult role because they 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 were divested of all the authority because they didn't have control of the money. Money controls things. But in your in your instance and in instances because you're you're a grown up in this conversation and in most conversations, we might disagree ideologically and, th- and philosophically about things, but we're, there's a conversation to be had with someone you, like you mm-hmm. and I can learn a lot mm-hmm. from it. I didn't think I learned a lot from many of the chief executives I encountered. And I'm seeing the quality of chief executives really raise now. I see people like Paul Barber and these are proper chief executives that understand the responsibility. They're very fortunate to get to work for very decent owners like Tony Bloom that are very committed. But what do you think in football terms makes a very good chief executive well i was fortunate in having a wonderful owner in david moores you you couldn't i didn't like him very much by the way i, I like I, like, I didn't like being given a i didn't like being given a pendant by david moores in the ballroom at liverpool in the 2001 league cup semi-final saying this is what we give to all the small clubs when they come here i didn't much like that rick i didn't enjoy that well, okay. I have a different view of David because David was a brilliant chairman to work for, yep. cared passionately about the club, put the club way in front of his own interests, yep. uh, lifelong fan, um, completely supportive. You know, I've talked about purpose uh, being really important. And it, it, it sounds like a statement of the obvious, but often stating the obvious frequently helps. Our purpose at Liverpool was winning trophies. Yeah. Uh, and we hadn't won any for quite a long time. Um, and Gerard bought into that completely. So um, if you look at the first season, I was involved with Gerard, 2000, 2001. Obviously, getting into the Champions League mattered. But the start of the season, we sat down with the players at the training camp and said, going to talk purpose. We're going to talk about what we're all here for. We're going to talk about winning silverware. So and that then comes down to team selection in the cup competitions and mm. and the priorities and 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 not using the league cup as an opportunity to field the youth team. Um, always a tricky balance, but you know. But as a chief executive, you'd have not much jurisdiction in that area, though, would you? Getting the dynamics right in football. If you've got the manager, the chief executive, and the owner, stroke chairman, all on the same page Aligned, and yeah. pulling in the same direction, yeah. you've got a, you've really, got good chance, a yeah. really good chance. Yeah. Which then kind of contrasting that with how we any achi- ever achieved anything with Hicks and Gillette is well, that's is, my question next. Yeah, is one of life's great mysteries. So having everybody aligned in what we're trying to achieve massively important. Um, but how said, quickly into their involvement did you think? Christ, what have I got here? Uh, the day before they took over. <laughs> okay. The day before they took over because we uh, we had a press conference to announce it. Um, we'd known George for quite a long time. Um, David actually got to quite like George. Uh, he was a decent fella, very likable. Um, we'd been over to see his ice hockey team, uh, and he just gave us free reign. He literally gave us the keys and said, just wander around, talk to anybody. And, and that was quite commendable. Um, and then he brought Tom Hicks in literally a week before. So we did, we hadn't met Tom. We didn't really know Tom. They had done business together. Um, they've been in meat packing together. And again, this is classic of you can happily survive together in many businesses, but football yeah. is something special. Yeah. So we have the we're planning for the press conference to announce the deal. And we had a very professional PR advisor who was teeing the whole thing up. Uh, and it's a big announcement, massive announcement for Liverpool, the Moores family selling. It's it's it's, yeah. it's it's huge. It's you know, it is an icon, it has to be done properly. So we're kind of doing the briefing on don't ever call them the Liverpool Reds. Don't mention franchise, you know, all the things you have to do yeah, with them. Yeah. All the missteps the Americans could make. The Americans yeah. might make. Yeah. And they said, right, running order, probably best if Rick starts because he can explain why the club came to the position uh, of needing to sell. No problem with that. 
and George, you should go second because you've been around for six months. And Tom Hicks said, I'm going second. If he goes first, I'll never get a word in Edwidge. <laughs> okay. And I'm honestly, at that point, what I'm thinking, yeah. what are we doing here? What is going on here? Because mm -hmm. this just, and you know, when your first instincts yeah, you are negative, yeah. Yeah. it's generally right. They're not always right when they're positive, but when they're negative, and you, and back to that need for togetherness, they were 50 50, absolute 50 50. There were no deadlock provisions. And, you know, which is ridiculous, isn't it? It was rushed. They put it together quickly. Yeah, with hindsight, well, even with foresight, it was ridiculous. We didn't know that at the time, but that that was the source of many, many challenges later. You lead me into Rafa. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I have to say, uh, I'm not an admirer. I think he's one of the most divisive football managers around. Um, you had explicit experience of him, and I think challenges with him. We had some really good times. Yeah. Um, or 2005. 2005. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. So he's, you know, he's got a place in Liverpool's history. Um, did brilliantly. And as a coach, you know, if you, if, if you wanted to hire somebody to set up a team to win a particular game, He's as good Rafa as would get. be right up there. Yeah. Um, absolutely gets it. And I think Rafa would acknowledge, um, perhaps grudgingly, I think he would acknowledge that with the Moores family, he actually had something quite special. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a be careful what you wish for. I think with Rafa, it was we need new investment. We want to be competing. We want to win. And we all wanted to win. Um and you know he did, he did to an extent play one owner off against the other, backfired on him because he got fired a year in, which was, I mean, just bizarre. Hadn't backed him properly in the transfer market. Um, I, I think Rafa in the right environment and with the right structure, with an owner and chief executive, and him aligned is yeah. great. But isn't alignment with Rafa Benitez defined by him? No, not no. I think if if there's a chink, if there's a weakness, he'll exploit it. He may try to exploit it. I think if the boundaries are clear, yeah, then in his lane, he's fine. And yeah. th the thing I would never, never challenge Rafa on was his passion was all about success yeah. and winning, and we were completely and utterly aligned on that. What did you make of his, I mean, that people paraphrase it as his iconic rant about facts and Sir Alex Ferguson. You're sitting as chief executive, are you going, what, 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 or are you going, you know, fill your boots, Rafa, if you want to no, go down No, 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 mate. And, and it's quite interesting because we were playing away at Stoke in a, uh, in a morning game. And if we'd won, we'd have gone top. We'd have gone ahead of United again. Rafa had actually been... Um, off sick over Christmas with um, had a very painful kidney stone, and we'd actually done really well. Sammy Lee took temporary right. charge, and we battered Bolton at home. We'd gone up and won four at Newcastle, and then Rafa came back, and again we were playing early. Uh, Dirk Kite did an interview the other day, and it, it was kind of brought back memories of that season that we always seemed to play early. United played late. And when we got on the plane to travel home, they'd be losing. And when we got off it, they'd have got an 89th minute winner. So suddenly they'd leapfrog. But that that game at Stoke was all about opportunity for us to get three points. And, and we drew nil-nil, terrible game. Uh, and it was quite interesting that some of the leading players were thinking, why is it about him? This should be about the team. Yeah. And big occasion for us. Or do it after the game. Yeah. You know, do it. Yeah. when we've actually built something and yeah. achieved something. But piling that pressure on, what what is the point? Why do you think he did it? Oh, I have no idea. No. I have no idea because he didn't tell us in advance, which yeah. would be typical Rafa. And there wasn't a lot of point in saying, what did you do that for? Because the moment has, has gone. And, you know, as we'd seen with... Kevin Keegan, years before, what would the reaction be from Fergie? He'd have fallen about laughing yeah. and thought, got you. Got you.